Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I always wanted to start, uh, uh, I always dream of starting a stand-up comedy routine uh, with a line, I'm an artist, uh, uh, I'm an artistic researcher. And uh, so it goes without saying I'm funny and relatable. <laughs> and there was this love, of course. Um, but uh, going into the into our project, I think it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here because uh, I, re I really believe in that in the in the context uh, of the of the song school, and that's why when we first heard about it, we started working and thinking about it in terms of uh, the pedagogical term that Billy uh, has just mentioned. So our project is in fact called uh, uh, a song pedagogy, a manual for the drift, uh, because we wanted to really think about uh, what in the interdisciplinary context of the of the song school of the song school can actually be brought as a pedagogical methodology. methodology. So there are several things that we developed, that we developed, and we are going to try to present it today in a very short, uh, like way, hopefully. Um, so what we really brought our mind around is the question of knowledge production in the context of the swamp, because uh, we wanted to think about the redefining aspects of uh, adaptation, what the, and, and that means to think of pedagogy in its ecological and decolonized means, uh, uh, which means bringing to the discourse uh, uh, the system of relationships uh, that uh, the swamp, uh, and in our specific case, the Venice Lagoon, embodies uh, um, in terms of uh, environmental and ecosystemical uh, aspects. So, uh, a couple of uh, uh, things that you might have already heard, but uh, since we are pretty smart, we can repeat ourselves. Thank you. Um, the, the swamp is an ecosystem that we actually don't, don't fully understand, uh, and that's actually something that we understand. So uh, that's actually the premise. We understand that we don't understand the swamp. Uh, so that brings into, uh, into question the, uh, the means of adaptation and cohabitation and coexisting and cooperation with the swamp. Uh, um, so how does pedagogy come into, into the game? Um, to reformulate the, the modernist paradigm of knowledge production that is based on top-down enforcement of knowledge, it means a teacher or lecturer in front of, in front of uh, ignorance, um, ignorant students, is the, is the classic and it's the traditional paradigm. So, uh, a swamp pedagogy should aim a kind of reformulate this, uh, not uh, really um, abandon it or kind of trying to destroy it, but really just think about it a little more. Um, it means to, to start thinking in terms of non-linear knowledge production, which uh, is uh, something that metaphorically can be uh, associated with the question, uh, with the question, with the concept of drifting. Um, we really want to work out uh, uh, this concept of drifting because uh, in a way, it lies, it contains and embodies uh, the potentiality. Uh, because to drift, uh, you can uh, either safely drift uh, to some uh, non-sunny -sun shores, but at the same time, uh, you can drift in the open sea, into the unknown. So we're really interested in the potentiality that uh, the movement of drifting actually carries. And that's actually something interesting when you start thinking of in terms of drifting related to knowledge production and teaching and learning, because it means to allow yourself to go wherever you don't know. Um, at the same time, to uh, drift is, uh, is a form of imagining a potential reality plane that, of course, doesn't exist, uh, and leaving it and bringing it into the existent, into the existent reality. So, um, that's why we kind of started thinking in terms of, uh, uh, we started thinking the swamp and the lagoon in particular as a form of infrastructure. And uh, all the organisms that uh, live in the swamp and in the lagoon are, um, we focus on plants because we really wanted to focus on the question of the technological properties of plants. Uh, meaning the knowledge that is embodied in the plants. 
a knowledge is not really embodied in the plants as uh, per se, but uh, a, a form of knowledge that is embodied in the relationship that all, always existed between humans and non-humans, between humans and plants. So, so and it's this kind of, uh, kind of uh, given, um, given for granted knowledge or sometimes even forgotten knowledge that uh, we believe can uh, kind of project us uh, into the future. It's in this kind of knowledge that uh, uh, our pedagogical term should look into in this um, adapting and coexisting, uh, coexisting and co uh, cohabitation uh, with plants. So, so to make it very short, uh, we really uh, try to use uh, um, plants, uh, plant species that are present in, in the lagoon and in the swamp uh, to develop everything that, uh, that you can see here from the drink that the teacher is making and that are going to be served to you in a moment. Um, to, the, to the bamboo, of course, the table, but more interesting, um, more importantly, uh, which is also in the title, is the question of demand. We really wanted to rework the form, the format of the of the manual, which is uh, kind of the traditional again modernist way of delivering knowledge in a very uh, tidy and precise and uh, linear way. So our our manual, it's it, it, it's kind of useless, you know. It's kind of uh, uh, embodies some form of uselessness, but it's precisely this uselessness interest us because um, in a way it goes uh, against the, the neoliberal paradigm of function functionality where, we, where we, we live in a society where everything is a function, where uh, every action is, uh, is needed to serve something, a purpose. So we really wanted to make a model that uh, apparently doesn't serve any purpose, doesn't serve any function. Um, it's constructed uh, in order to uh, bring together heterogeneous forms of knowledge. Uh, means that you can find uh, speculative design, uh, uh, an essay, and uh, technical information about the plans that we used in the project. Uh, and we organize that in uh, uh, we organize that through the transparency of the manner, meaning that uh, knowledge is not this uh, kind of uh, uh, thing that uh, always substitutes itself, that uh, some notion always substitutes what precedes them. But uh, we really wanted to work on transparency, meaning that we worked on the uh, stratification of knowledge, which is a more um, realistic way of describing how knowledge is in fact produced. So, um, we are done with the, with the talking because, uh, again, if our pedagogical turn is to avoid this kind of moment where I'm, I'm here teaching you, and I think we should all share a drink and we're going to serve it to you. So, thank you for the opportunity to be here and present our project on Soundscape, the undetectable sound of this one. Thinking about communism, the first thing we thought to create was a relational space. In this environment, the anthropocentric perspective can be overturned. Humans can be producer and receiver at the same time in a soundscape with ends. No more differences then in the scale between humans and animals. What is normally undetectable, such as ants' interaction, becomes finally audible. So, let's speak about ants for a while. Very hardly, we think about a standing alone ant. It's more realistic to think about ants in line on their way for different pets. So, telling about ants is actually telling about a settlement. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of 60s, <laughs> scientists stopped speaking about a group of ants as a superorganism. They began properly to call it a community. There was a change of thinking. From the thought of an organization on the top of the settlement that governed it, to the thought of the instinct of each member of the social organization. This 
complex internal organization establishes a strong relation also with the environment. A real symbiosis with plants. In lagoon area and in different environments, ants are the creatures with the most substantial role in creating biodiversity. They consume a high percentage of seeds produced by different plants. During their journeys, they accidentally lose some of the seeds. This way, they contribute to foster the proliferation of some local floral species and rearranging their distribution. They are called ecosystemic engineers, or better, gardeners. We think about them as silent creatures, but they aren't. The time of foraging is one of those rare cases, along with the times of danger, in which ants emit strident sounds with their antennas in order to call their fellows for cooperation. And that's the moment we capture and we are reproducing in the sound installation. A recorder track is made by a recorder manipulated communication between ants. We receive it from the Department of Bioacoustic of the University of Pavia. And so our thanks go to Professor Gianni Pavan. The specific sound emitted by ants is made by stridulation. It's polycentric, created by listeners and repliers interacting with each other. Matthew Gandhi speaks about interiority or saturation to describe what the sound of animals gives to a soundscape. Emitted sounds by ants reach peaks of 70 decibel and 100 decibel at a distance of one centimeter. Humans are tuned just into a small fraction of the acoustic reel, given the limitation of human hearing to a range from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. The vibration-based communication of ants is made audible by converting input sampling sequence from 160 hertz to kilohertz to 32 kilohertz. Interaction of animal sounds makes sound sonorously positive, so the hearing of animal sound signifies the retreat or diminution of human sound. But this doesn't mean that human disappears. Instead, it means that a listening space is created. What does it mean to have relations in a soundscape? Soundscapes are more than sounds. They are sounds joined by relations. These relations can be external, the sounds of the physical space of the swamp school, for instance, or internal, when sounds are produced in an interchange as between ends. That's why we decide not to use headphones, but to make the audio track audible in a space of interactions. We want it to become a space where to reflect about our role as part of the environment with the consciousness of an environmental thought. So I think I can end my talk with a quote from Michel Serret. We depend on things that depend on us. And thanks for your attention. We invite you to enter to the sound installation and be part of that. The goal of the project is to reinforce and build the social identity of the individual through the emancipation of creativity. 
but Chaplin and Harmonies too, the individual can identify with the social group to which he or she belongs. Imagining solutions, common issue, is already in itself a political art. The ability to share these ideas can trigger a process of emancipation which can bring the members of society closer together and improve their cohesion. Moreover, facing complex problems without a technical background can lead to new ideas and innovative approaches. Most of the time, it is a small group of people that solve social issues. While expanding, this group can lead to share solutions, making said problems more felt in the community. The purpose of the project is not to replace the technical approach with a material one. On the contrary, the project aims to encourage the technical approach by feeding it with ways that are utopical but potentially useful. Yeah, finally, making problem solving processes transparent and horizontal changes the way the public perceives the so called public machines. You know? So, uh, maybe we can start, you know, uh, is, uh, everything is about uh, drawing uh, some utopical, utopic solution for the thinking problem in Venice. So, there is a lot of uh, pens and a lot of paper and uh, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't need to be, you know, technical, but uh, just an idea, just uh, wondering about solution, you know. So maybe we can start. Here you can find uh, uh, some uh, tests that I made with uh, a geologist and a biologist about uh, the backdrop of Venice. So how is it and uh, who is it in the backdrop? And with this maybe we can have a bit of contest of uh, everything is going on. And uh, we can start. You know? Hello everyone. Thank you for being here. We are very happy to thank the Swamp School for giving us the opportunity to share this project. Um, as you can get from the title, we're gonna talk about food but um, definitely with a wider approach. Um, inspired by the biologists Lynn Margulis and Scott Gilbert, we have considered uh, nourishment not simply a mere um, food or a way to um, involve our body and our gesture in, in our life, rather consider it a crucial element of the social life. In fact, the professor Gilbert um, has argued what suits for the body suits for the society and vice versa. That means that we are committed to contribute to the society as each um, organism living in us contributes to the body wealth. But when the nourishment has been overcome by acceleration of lifetime, the community gets affected too. When the diet and its urgencies become the weakling of a worn out community, feeding should come back to be a social act, where people cluster, socialize, and share knowledge. The body and the society are engaged in the process of symbiosis which is a key factor to develop relationships and to certain a stable coexistence. So the simple act of preparing and eating food together can be the trigger of this symbiosis process. Especially in a society where every conception of common space or common act seems to be completely forgotten. This conception, according to intellectuals such as Silvia Federici, are the only possible basis for a community not self-segregated on ethnic or religious groups. But today what happening said is that what should be property of no one and matter of everybody becomes prey to privatization and commodification. At this condition, there is any space for any symbiotic process. Rather, a division into parts becomes inevitable. And the statement, we against you, seems to be the only way to protect personal interests. So 
Paradoxically, in the globalization age when interconnection is persistent and unavoidable, the human condition seems to sink into what Hobbes called homo homini lupus, man who lives as a wolf towards other men. If I get rid of you, there would be more possibility for me, and your death is my life. Needless to say, this perspective is self-destructive. As we said, to maintain a stable coexistence, we need to activate processes of symbiosis within the society. We need a different paradigm for human relationships. Today, with this simple act of sharing, uh, we want to submit to you our proposal that we called Homo homini amphibium, man who behaves like an amphibian towards other men. But what do we mean with amphibian? Being amphibians means being sensitive in order to adapt to different environments adapting and not taking over them. It means being aware of the difficulties related to the complex balance of life conditions. It means being conscious that every action has an impact on the environment balance and finally taking responsibility for every action. As a result, the amphibian recognizes the annihilation of the others as a deprivation rather than a victory. Bearing all this in mind, his environment cannot but be porous, has to say a life condition where the difference between internal and external, public and private, is transient, and everything is a common matter. So our workshop aims to expand our sensorial abilities, using food as a language and the nourishment as a common system. We have selected and prepared some edibles, swan herbs, and our invitation to all of you is uh, to taste and manipulate them or whatever you like and uh, share it. So enjoy. <laughs> I will start directly, and I like people there. <laughs> <You're kidding. laughs> okay, so admirably accurate measurements and projections are continually being made concerning the rapid increase in the chemical pollution of the breathable atmosphere as of rivers, streams, and already oceans. Irreversible accumulation of radioactive waste that can be developed on nuclear power for so called Baptist control process. The effects on noise, the preparation of space by plastic junk that threatens to turn it into an everlasting refuse plant, perforates widely out of control, the demand of the mediation of foodstuffs, urban sprawl everywhere, overrunning what was once town and countryside, and likewise the spread of mental illness, including the neurotic fears and hallucinations that are bound to proliferate in response to pollution in itself. The alarming features of which are placarded everywhere and of society, the street of increased precious in parallels, the accelerating construction of this environment. This was an extract from the Borset's essay, A Sick Planet, and it was never so contemporary. To talk about the Trump project, uh, I need to start from a metaphor. This metaphor is that of suicide, or suicide attempts. Because suicide attempt basically represents the recent phase of the course of history. We humans are like a drive on a mountain road covered by a bank of fog. This fog bank is the pollution that we undertook to create. We are so panicked by this situation that the only thing that comes is to come out of this fog bank. And to do so, we are willing to crash against the tree. Against the tree. Moreover, we have we commit no serves that in this case we will not only end our life, but also that of the tree itself. We deeply enjoy the thought of our power over nature. For us, nature is like an old mother that we have to cure, or whose life we have to handle. Instead, we shall learn from someone that really committed suicide to think about nature after us. For Ellie, e Morselli, Guido Morselli, wrote a novel, Dissipazio HG, where the protagonist has to face the disappearance of the human race from the earth. But differently from him, nature doesn't care about this 
extension. The birds continue to sing, robotons continue to work, and the night follows the day. Only the protagonist, being human, feels the absence of the human. That of Marcel is a journey, a trip, where a fundamental concept comes out, that of the organic feeling. The organic feeling is a synesthetic pleasure, the sensation of a smell, a perfume, caused by the view of the mountains. Marcel is not simply immersed in the fluid of the ambience, he is pervaded by it like in an osmotic process. This organic feeling can mislead, but it's not a romantic feeling. Marcel is not uh, a new wanderer uh, above, uh, above the sea of fog. There's no nature to kill. Because for Marcel, pollution is a problem created by humans that invest human themselves. So when pollution disappears, it is because it, its odor disappears. That of Dissipatia Kaji obviously is a fiction. It is improbable that the human species as a whole can disappear during an army. This event is used by Marcel as an announced uh, retaliation for his suicide. His novel actually looks like a testament. What we need to keep in mind uh, is the look at the near future. As for the fact, fiction too refers to action, with reference to the act of shaping, forming, inventing, as well as counterfighting or pretending. Derived by the present participle, fiction is on the way and still in play, not concluded, still inclined to collide with that, but also liable of showing something that we still don't know is real. These are words from Donna Harry that can let us read more sadly story like a continued trip between process and dissolution, between nature and culture, <coughs> human and non-human, organic and technological, carbon and silicium also, and story <coughs> Romanticism, nihilism, and self pity are put away uh, in favor of the extreme dilatation of the moment, of the permanence of the provision, and the undaunted indeterminateness. At this point, it is interesting to understand why nature culture dualism was born. For example, for Agamben, starting with, with the birth of the basis, the basis have their roots in the same process of immunization that made the humans uh, the animals that we classify as homo sapiens. Hominization is a split of the human from its environment. We can understand then that this is a problem of cognition. As Matrana and Marilla wrote in um, Autopoiesis and Cognition, everything that is said is said by an observer. It means that human constructs are uh, only appearances. Every associ association we make between apparently correlated entities are associations only for us that observe these entities, while actually they are independent. There is no cause effect relationship. Morcelli already gets this, because in his romance, in his novel, um, the headlights of his car and on his mountain roads uh, in, in the night uh, heat illuminate the rats across the streets. But these rats don't modify the, their roots, they, they don't modify their behavior. What Morcelli is doing is to differentiate an entity from its background. So, the entity is the rats and the background is the road. In order to execute a, mechani a mechanism of ontologi ontological organization to orient himself, it doesn't modify the environment in this way. All this doesn't mean that we, we don't have to take a, a position. We have to, to choose how we want to orient with others and with others in the environment. But we don't have to form um, to, to abandon ourselves to forms of superhumanism or uh, like that of transhumanism, and we don't have to abandon ourselves to uh, an apocalyptic theatricality, theatricalities, as that of weird form of ecologists, like that of Timothy Morton with this dark ecology, in ecology without nature. Morton himself talks about Maturana and Varela in ecology without nature when he says that. Uh, the most compliant idea of nature should be that of, of uh, organic theories, made of automatism, repetitiveness, mechanicity. Organicism contains a mechanical component latent in the word organism itself that derives from the Greek organ, machine, instrument. So, in this ecological frame, I'm trying to follow what Donna Haraway says about art and engineering. Because art and engineering 
are sister practices and both are about companion species. So the variations of the human landscape comfortably adapt to the category of companion species. In other words, engineering should interact with the environment in the same cooperative way we interact with dogs as companions, with an exchange where none of the parts overcomes the other. Uh, we all know that anthropization is inevitable. For this reason, I designed an ecological drainage system. Uh, even though drainage is not a correct term for this system, because uh, as the drainage system is a method of improvement of, the, of hydraulic condition, the, mm, this, system, this system doesn't modify the soil, doesn't drain the soil, as this <laughs> says. Um, I have to tell about the story of this project because I like to go to churches, I like to go to creeks. And uh, in one of them, we have discovered a technique used by ancient Romans. So we should learn from our ancestors the positive things and use, reutilize them. In San Lazaro's church in Milan, I discovered that Romans used uh, had the practice to uh, use the uh, amphora as foundation layer. Um, these samples were, were upside down uh, and directly in contact with raw earth side as a foundation layer in order to keep buildings healthy and free of damp, free of humidity. This drainage system allows to stop the damp coming from groundwater from rising, a, proce a procedure which has often been noted during archaeological excavation in Milan, Venice and other locations in Italy. And these locations are um, what underpins all these locations is, is the marshy ground, a ground usually made of clay, so like in the swamp. The amphora system is totally different from the modern ones, as the latter are expensive and require soil excavation, while the first don't modify the soil and implies the reusing of existing products. So my proposal is to put into practice the, this ecological mindfulness that comes from the world, from the and by creating a modern amphora system using the industrial equivalent for the ancient containers that are uh, white neck plastic drums. Drums are cheap, easy to find, and replicate very well the process that happens with amphora. Moreover, in the swamp environment, which predicts with what will happen in the near future, we will be surrounded by all the plastic that we produced. So, the, the most uh, clever, the most intelligent way to reuse this plastic is for another uh, function. So, to refunctionalize re these objects that we already produced. Thank you. We want to thank you for being here this afternoon. Our project focuses its research on proposing a um, possibility of overcoming the binomial vision of the world, like for example, nature culture, artificial nature, human plants or animals, and naturally others. Nowadays, the nature as pure and con contaminant element doesn't exist anymore. What we observe today is a domesticated nature. An accelerated and obsessive production of artificial environment, as example the garden we see, have produced this type of nature in which the other organisms are considered like objects. However, the relationship between men and plants is a bone which contains self the traits of our region. According to Dee Burroughs' work, the plants become therefore an amazing indicator of the cultural history and our space appropriation method. The nature uh, is so uh, full of symbolic implication that we could define the natural side as a kind of metaphor of fooling. The plant uh, is the, the heart of the living system. As written by Valentina Ivancic um, in a heroism book, uh, We and the Trees, as and we trees, sorry, um, and uh, like she said yesterday. We have started from uh, this suggestion to, to project a sculpture in which we have considered the vegetal, um, the vegetal kingdom like um, a niche in which uh, we, we found the, the attitudes and um, the archive behaviors of human surviving time. 
The project looks into the relationship between humans and plants and considers how, how much this has um, uh, been able to contribute the, to our evolution and uh, whether it's fundamental for living now. In fact, the plants, uh, as we know, release oxygen, absorb carbon dioxide, change the solar light into sugar, stabilize the soil, provide food uh, for the majority of the animals, hold water, preventing desertification, hollow the constitution and the maintenance of microenvironments. So, uh, we could say that uh, the vegetal kingdom has been a sort of uh, um, spectator of all whole human evolutionary phases. About this, uh, we have chosen the geranium as an example of this um, uh, kind of relationship, relation between uh, human and plants, for two reasons. The first one is an economical reason, because the geranium is the most sold kind of pork plants um, for uh, uh, its appearance and, uh, and in fact uh, um, the geranium is selected for a garden uh, and uh, balconies. The second one is linked, linked uh, to the high tree uh, because the geranium has uh, a lot of therapeutic properties for its active substances. Uh, in fact, uh, um, it is uh, like um, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, antibacterial, antiseptic, antidepressive, and um, many others. So for uh, this reason, in ancient times, naturally, this type of plant were used to um, um, cure people, the, the healthy people. After um, choose the, the plants, uh, the geranium, we start an analysis of um, growth plant parameters as pH factor, um, the, the quantity of the clay naturally for, for the pit, and the growth um, the grow rate of the stem. So um, the design of the of the sculpture uh, follows the um, the growth of the, the plant and represents a new approach that we should have towards the vegetal kingdom, based on especially um, these three um, concepts: respect, connection, and communion. Okay. So now I want to describe you the the sculpture. So. Regarding the sculpture, we have chosen the natural wood to create the pot. Uh, and inside the central hall, we have put a mix of soy wax, paper, uh, coffee and paper, that um, fertilizing the soil and feed the plant too. Uh, the, um, the mix has also another purpose that is functional for the plant. In fact, the layer of wax top the, the water drops that fall on the base of the sculpture and uh, avoiding the drying of the soil. Concerning the, the shape, its aim is to create a sort of comfortable space with the three grid and um, like Simona said previously, before we build in the sculpture, we have uh, studied the way in which this type of plant, that is geranium, grows. And after this analysis, we have choose the best measure and the best shape that the um, sculpture should have to help the extension of the branches of this type of plant. And so the research uses the architectural process like a tool and model through which the human um, consider the, the word and have knowledge of it. So this is the analysis of the, the architecture, the, the measure of the, the architecture. And with regard to the architectural process, we have considered the cultivation and urbanization practice. So the first one, the cultivation, and the second one, the urbanization practice. And the correlation they have although they are ideologically opposed. In fact, the first one move toward nature, the second one's against it. And in the worst case, causing the destruction of the, the ecosystem. But exists a sort of visual analogy between these two processes. As you can see in the slide, we have removed the context, maintaining the line that defines the structure. And it's visible a sort of I studied coherence between these two processes. And a perfect example of the urbanization process is 
the one of Cartagena de India. And we have to thank Lorena Bello and Brent Ryan, who have allowed us to use their photo that represent an important documentation of this process. In this territory, in fact, the poor people used to live in the swamp and they start to build some structure uh, that over time become a real city. So as you can see in the slide from the first image that is a natural landscape to the last image that is a real city. So these um, three images represent a real process of urbanization practice. <coughs> and uh, in the same, uh, it is visible, for example, in this image, um, the development of the structure, so from the simple stick of booth, for example, to the silt house, and the damaging of the, of the habitat, so the natural habitat in that case, in of the swamp. And in the same way, in the vegetable garden, the human built a simple structure to help the plant grow. And while the, um, the plant increasing inside and expanding their branches, this structure became compound and set up a sort of um, plant architecture in a way that is very similar to the to human architecture. And therefore, the maquette on show uh, has been conceived combining the cognitive human method and the plants uh, human method uh, Sorry, the plant's cognitive method, uh, which resides in a never ending adaptation activity. So, thank you. And thank the, the maquette is the, the installation in the first room of the first one. The first room in, of this one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. We will talk about a project that is not here, but is settled on, a, on an abandoned island in Campalto, in the north side of the lagoon. The project takes inspiration from my research on Belt and Road Initiative. This Chinese project um, is an infrastructure grid across lands and seas of three continents, which will reshape the 21st century, the 21st century trade route. It consists on, this is the map, it consists on five, on five major um, economic corridors passing through high uh, ecological risk region. But it's also layered on second, on secondary, uh, sorry, secondary and tertiary routes that will link Land, land, landlocked countries to the sea, to the seashore, and to the new ports, especially to the new ports are, that are being built in, in the um, east coast of, of Africa. This project also reflects the internal policy of China because uh, China is, turn, is about to like, have a, an industrial shift. Is, is becoming like is adapting a green economy and so uh, belt and road uh, countries will be the um, will be the main uh, spot will be the main country for factory displacement above all Africa and but also Eastern Europe uh, after in 2014, Suez Canal was was an, an enlarged, was doubled, and now up to 100 ships uh, per day can pass through the canal. Um, and so the high uh, the high Adriatic Sea has been pointed out as the major gateway uh, to reach uh, northern and eastern European markets. Uh, we focused on the global impacts of, uh, of this Belt and Road Initiative on, on, on wetlands. And we noticed that um, in some area, of, of, in some parts of the world, in some region of the world, such as Mongolian steppes, or Am Amur River Basin, or also Congo Basin, there are several problems uh, with big projects that are, that are reshaping the, the, the landscape of this, of this place. Uh, for example, in Tanzania there will be, there, there, there is a project on, ba on Bagamoyo, which is uh, 
a small swamp that in three, four years there will become one of the largest ports in Africa. It will be about a 30 kilometers uh, port, uh, which will link Dar es Salaam to, to Bagamoyo. And, in, and Venice has started yet like, uh, he, uh, some, some projects. And for example, this year, uh, the Malamocco Marghera Canal, the, the, the main entrance to the port of Marghera was dredged allowing uh, cargoes up to 335 meters to enter the, the lagoon. This, and, and Chinese enterprises, Chinese investors are uh, very active in this moment in the city. Uh, there are new projects, new banks, new, new funds on, on, in, in order to develop and to enlarge the 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 port and by 2020 this um, the the operative plan the, uh, of the city will be finished and the new port will become operative with the larger container um, terminal and and new and new in industries plans around Marghera. Uh, we choose uh, Campalto Island to analyze uh, <coughs> how could be the impact of, of this project on the lagoon. And Campalto is uh, at, at the intersection of several currents of, of the of, uh, of ma marine currents of the lagoon uh, between Marghera, the airport, and Murano. So we searched lots of dumps of local international uh, production who which uh, which which dump in the in Campalto. And if you want to speak about Campalto, okay. <laughs> um, the island of Campalto is uh, located in the central lagoon on the Tortora Canal and uh, is between Venice and uh, the town <coughs> of Campalto. So the island takes its name from the homonymous uh, town on the coast in front of it. Um, Campalto was one of the eight batteries that uh, defended the, the city with uh, headquarters of uh, military post since the times of uh, La Serenissima. Um, the battery had a um, polygonal uh, shape, uh, um, typical of the local Fortini, uh, yet it, it was one of the smallest. Uh, during the Second World War, the island served as an anti-aircraft uh, shelter, but uh, after the end of the conflict, uh, it was abandoned for almost 20 years. Uh, during the 60s, the island was converted into a, a dumping ground full of uh, glass from Murano. And um, after five years of um, continued collection of trash, the island caught fire and uh, the glass that littered the island melted into rocks. <coughs> uh, even if the town was uh, later closed, uh, today, uh, nowadays, the, the island is uh, still full of trash that is uh, mainly brought by Venetians with uh, their own uh, private boats and uh, therefore Campalto nowadays is an um, uninhabited island um, that uh, represents uh, an invisible point in the lagoon. Um, due to its uh, particular location, Campalto is at the intersection, as Matteo said previously, uh, of different water currents, not only from Venice, but also from Marghera, from the Marco Polo's airport, and from Murano. Um, this is the reason why the island collects not only the trash brought by Venetian, Venetians, but also um, the waste carried by the sea. Uh, the island, uh, moreover, the island of uh, Campalto is also a uh, unique habitat because uh, the nearby Ponte della Libertà acts as a barrier limiting the exchange of water currents. 
Uh, in fact, the bridge uh, runs along the line where fresh water and salty sea water meet. Uh, so, uh, the barrier of uh, Ponte della Libertà, the excavation of deep canals to allow uh, the navigation uh, through the lagoon, but also the um, accumulation of uh, industrial and uh, domestic uh, waste in the water, have severely affected the natural habitat of the island. So that's the reason why we choose uh, Camp Out. Okay. Um, so, uh, as uh, Matteo Tommaso introduced, uh, the island is a, a crossroad of different contaminations. And contamination is an important word, I think, for describing our world because um, contamination uh, as could be organic, like uh, uh, what 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 brought by the uh, water ballast discharge of the international cargo ships, uh, or could be inorganic contamination, as uh, the waste of industrial production we found in the island. So uh, carried by carried by the water or just discharge. So what we are doing in the um, in the island was uh, preparing a sort of uh, research outpost, out, yeah, sorry, outpost for studying and catalog what has considerably changed the island system. Um, as outpost, we, we chose an old dusty bun bunker, which has the same size of a standard shipping container. And to underline this connection we, with, the, with the shipping and with the containers, indeed, uh, we, we covered the, um, the bunker's wall with some metal sheets we found there. Uh, the past of the island uh, as a rubbish dump, in a certain way, helped us to find materials to use for our purpose. And yeah, uh, exploring the island, we, we found, collected and cataloged a lot of cases of study, inorganic and organic. <coughs> uh, inorganic like uh, uh, as, as I said, um, waste from industrial production like bricks or tiles or just the, the boxes from the, fish market. Uh, from the fish market because we we found that in, in the different uh, sides of the island we found different kinds of wastes like in, in, in the side of the airport we found like uh, boxes for, for, the, for the shipping, for the air shipping in the, sign, uh, in the side of the fish market of Tronchetto, we found uh, um, plastic, uh, plastic packaging and uh, polyesters. Uh, or in the, in the side of Murano, we found, we found uh, mostly uh, glass and waste like that. So um, we, um, we try to, to catalog all, all of these uh, objects. Uh, organic, we, we, found, we found a lot of organic um, yeah. uh, stuff, sorry, the term. <laughs> nice. And we, we contacted the, historia, yeah. historic, um, uh, the National History Museum to help us to catalog and recognize this uh, work in progress thing because uh, it's quite difficult. Yeah, we, we, we still have to recognize some niece, some non-indigenous species that are carried by uh, by the cargoes uh, with like the the water ballast discharge and, uh, and the whole fooling problem and that are like colonizing the lagoon these are some example of oysters uh, seaweeds and crabs and, no, and crabs. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. And, and yeah we we left in in the bunker a sort of uh, small archive uh, open to to the people uh, in work in progress because we, we want to uh, continue with this project and <coughs> we, we made a short film really, really short film mm -hmm. and if the audio works uh, it's good if, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know let's do that
these are Murano glasses we found on the <coughs> west side, yeah, in front of Murano. Okay, thank you so much. I have a question actually. Uh, very simple, but you may know that in every uh, school or um, university, or let's say also in small school, it's inevitable that knowledge gathering is very important. You know? And um, archive has this idea of knowledge storage and sharing. So what I wanted to ask, did you go to the island with the idea of making archive already? Or did you get that idea and concept by, you know, no, exploring I, I, the island itself? It was a work in progress. So I, I, as soon as we get into, into the environment of Campalto, we changed our plans because we found other kind of traces and we also change our uh, we also changed uh, our idea of structure we we our first idea was to build like just a storage for for these kind of materials then as soon as we collect different kind of dumps and different kind of uh, international local uh, production we started to think about like uh, a small like to 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 write them to recognize them we made some, uh, some sheets. yes no yes some but yeah it was a work in progress one of the last day we 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 decided to like to recognize everything and and we left also the research there and some like, every materials as his own I don't know in English. Uh, every, everything okay. in in the container has a uh, his uh, his is no his own um, uh, description like the, yeah. the name the wh where we found it uh, uh, what is it and and we left all, all the all these sheets there uh, for, for but but the but the process. first idea was to organize as a container as a, a, a economically as a container the the space then it also became a smaller it, it it also became a small archive but later <laughs> yeah Maybe, you know, maybe there will be next year. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's open to everyone. Yeah. It's open to everyone. This island, you you can reach this island only by private boat. So uh, maybe lots of Venetian and local people <coughs> will, like, get in touch with this place. We, we don't know if the... the for example, we, 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 we don't know now if uh, the archive is still yeah. like <laughs> there. The, the process, because I think it's interesting also because we don't know Cara. what the, the impact we, with, the, with the people go to the island because uh, we could come back and found, find all completely destroyed and uh, or, or not, Cara. or maybe someone who's interested in, in the thing and uh, who knows yeah. as so part of this team there was also Chiara which is over yeah, there and sure. she didn't came she, yeah. she, she gave a like, great help uh, yeah. she came to, to come out to, to connect and to clear yeah. our mind yeah. because every day was a work in progress yeah. so every day <coughs> it was it it depended on what on what we found, and but we we were so lucky because we found interesting stuff from different kind of environments and and productions. Mm -hmm.
I also had a question. I was, um, you kind of answered in the previous statement. I was curious about um, the audience that you expected to kind of experience the space that you say, like, yeah, as I said, there is not like public connection, public transport to get there. Uh, there only you can only arrive by private boat, and th and this island is like it it, it now it, it used for barbecues, yeah. and f f and there there are not like good people who stay there with uh, it like depends, some so it think. depends yeah it's there are some crazy people so our public will be. <laughs> will be so so, so I, I don't know I, I don't know how to select them the these kind of people <laughs> no it's completely random I think. yeah it's completely yeah. random it's yeah. like a re restoring point for people who kayak so who goes but there are no signs to get there and mm -hmm. the island is not big but it's about I don't know do you know the size of the island maybe yeah, it's it's about, it's about an actor or a yeah, fact, I, I yeah, don't know. Okay. And this ba this bunker is in a bush inside, in, in the center of the island. So you have to, you have, you have to, you, you have to search the, so. And then do you have any kind of idea of the film that you made, for instance, like engaging the communities that you speak about, like the shipping, um, the fishing, the fishing communities, the kind of shipping communities, the Moran class, um, productions, but uh, well, businesses, these kinds of things. Is that something that um, is like a part of the project, the idea to to get in touch with these different communities, or and also in terms of just the film that is produced? Then how do you see where do you see that being shown, and to who do you see it being shown? No, our intention was not to get in touch with them, with uh, with. Uh, with yeah. but it's working pro to, you know yeah uh, but it's still a work in uh, progress yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, all we collected now is yeah. their uh, like trash is their uh, the thing that in a way it's like the trash for the people who come there by chance yeah. it might not be um, something that is necessarily immediately meaningful to them but somehow showing it to the people who actually produce mm. the things that, yeah. is, that are on display somehow has another kind of, I don't know, something, I don't know, that has the, the, the potential to have an effect, yeah. to change sure. something in a yeah. sense, because then there's this kind of really confrontation yeah. with something that you kind of take for granted in everyday life, that, that process of just going to and from your job. And when you're confronted with this archive of information of the effects of what is happening every day that you are actively a part of there's something I mean everybody is a part of it and everybody yeah. is actively a part of it but there's something quite interesting about the potential of having that conversation with the communities that are really yeah, yeah. interested in it and having economic um, also dependency on it uh, so it's also quite a com complex yeah thing. yeah but it's the point yeah <laughs> I think it's yeah very interesting thank you well. thank you thank you Just Yeah, I okay. also appreciate the, you know, this presence of choreographic force, if I may say so, because you have this uh, very interesting question between the residues and all these documents of the what we call trash, you know, the yeah. evidence of the human activity that surrounds the lagoon um, in the different type of fragments, you know, the life that was fragmented, you know, and now we have this, you know, the, the signifiers. Of, of, of the former action. Uh, meanwhile, in the image, what we see, we see ants, you know, yeah. uh, we see the water, you know, mm -hmm. we see the worms, you know, and, uh, and these are the elements of animation. Yeah. So they choreographically, in a way, they animate these documents, you know, they make them apparent, they make them more visible, they frame them. And I really, I'm really fascinated by that. In a way, it's almost like you know they are giving this kind of like you know second life or even like a different uh, kind of like perspective yeah. on, on the use of these histories and documents. Um, and I think for especially for I think uh, when when we speak about artistic practices, you know, when we speak about uh, archives that are political or the personal or the poetic, 
uh, I think the notion of uh, how one performs archive, you know, how one performs a document, how one's making histories apparent, you know, uh, and the use of choreograph, choreography as a form, you know, is uh, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Was also for, you know, uh, the contamination, you know. Uh, Things uh, arrives at the island, but the island uh, try to uh, make and them body. Uh, to sorry, and body. So. Yeah, to to take it, take him and make it home. You know, was sorry. Yeah, they they try to yeah. embody these embody. these kind of materials, yeah. and yeah. they become part of the environment there. Okay. Speaking about choreography, I really would like to add here another trajectory, the kind of choreographic move from one project to another, which is a, a soap workshop. And uh, ah, yeah. the, the things which were happening in the different Sorry, I, I, I forgot to mention this because, of course, my, my, this project started from, f from the second chapter from, from Futurity Island. We, we had a field trip in, in this island where, where we collected some materials and some of them you can find yeah, in the soap, in the, which are in the other room now. And, and maybe there are still some of their ob objects, but I don't know where, where they are. So yeah, uh, the, the idea started with the second chapter, <laughs> with the, within the second chapter, and uh, yeah, this. Well, the idea of soap is 
because of the history of silk making within Venice itself. And so we borrowed that <coughs> language to encase the soap. It's, it's not just, I guess, that's the idea that plays on souvenir and that kind of consumerist culture instead of just encasing. On the island, on, yeah, yeah, we'll have, we, I have like an example, maybe. <laughs> Also, for uh, you know, someone go there and don't take nothing uh, j just for be. You know, no, I didn't explain. Okay. In Europe, okay. like someone will like increase the supply, will collect something else, maybe like some items, and then it will be 
that notice as, as much as you know. Did you found these plastic bags or did you actually not about them? Actually. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's it. 